Hey, thanks for listening to Radio 64's interview with the man in charge of the localization for English-speaking territories for the game Mother 2, which was called Earthbound, and all other territories but Japan. I'm Mitch, and I'm also going to be interviewing Marcus Lindblom with my co-host Jack. Jack, say hi so everyone can get used to your voice. G'day. Well, it's pretty easy to know who he is at this point, isn't it? Because, you know, the good day and the Australian accent. <laughs> uh, there's going to be full spoilers of the game itself in the interview, although I think that you could have anticipated that, being that the game is 20 years old. And at this point, you might as well have either watched a video on YouTube of someone playing it, bought the game itself when it came out on Wii U Virtual Console, or played it in other means. Okay, and also we were planning on putting this in the beginning of the latest episode of Radio 64, episode number 9, where we actually did an in-depth review of Earthbound, the game. So if you want to go out and check that out, that would be cool. We might give you more context to the interview itself, but you're probably listening to this after that episode is released. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed the interview. <laughs> it is a bit lengthy, but I promise you it moves. You feel like you're learning a lot about the Earthbound series. There's some really cool stuff about Paula and um, Tony, the character Tony that we learn about. So, And it's all stuff that's never been heard. So, I mean, Jack, I was amazed, and I think that... Everyone listening, whether a listener to Radio 64 or just kind of a fan of Earthbound, will be pretty impressed with what Marcus has to say, don't you? I think so. We definitely learned a lot. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone tune in to Marcus's interview after the break. Enjoy and make sure to write us your thoughts. So as I said in the beginning of our episode, we have Marcus Lindblom, who was in charge of the English localization of Mother 2 to Earthbound 1, as it's dubbed in the States. So Marcus, say hi and uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're here talking to us. Um, yeah, so my name is Marcus Lindblom and I uh, worked at Nintendo, well, it was 20 years ago now that, uh, that I did the localization work on uh, Earthbound. And uh, which means that I ended up um, doing a lot of the writing that uh, had had come from uh, a sort of per- first pass translation that uh, we had gotten done with a, a translator in the office. And uh, but a lot of the stuff was pretty literal, or um, you know, done in a way that it didn't necessarily fit for an American audience and things. So what I did for the for the game was to go through pretty much all the lines of text and make any alterations that were needed or, uh, you know, sometimes change things if it was, you know, a a more appropriate uh, bit of text for for the American audience. You know, for example, there were jokes and things like that that were very geared towards the the Japanese audience. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I wrote. And so I ended up writing a large majority of the the text in the game. And uh, so that was my contribution to Earthbound. Yeah, and there's, there was an interesting debate going on a recent Kotaku article when Earthbound re-released on Virtual Console for the, I think it was for the Wii U, yeah, uh, in 2013. Um, there was an interview that Kotaku did with you, and in the title of their article, they labeled it, um, Meet the Man Who Wrote Earthbound. And then people were arguing back and forth in the comments about like what it really meant to write a game, you know, the script, I suppose. But I think from your description, you know, as much as you're trying to be humble, you did write Earthbound completely all over again for the English-speaking audience and that there was just so much to redevelop and there were character names to rename and just, like, towns and everything. It really, I think, from what the work you put in, you deserve that title of Earthbound script writer, don't you, so, don't you believe that yourself? Um, well, you, you know, so the one thing that's kind of weird in the... Uh... Uh, in the Japanese, well, not Japanese, in the Earthbound credits, um, you know, I was I was given three different credits, and and one of them is English writer. So, I mean, in 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 that case, that's what they put me down as for one of the credits. The other one was like localization uh, coordinator, I think, or something like that. Or I can't even remember all the exact terminology. And then there was a, a different coordinator job or something, just because I was doing a lot of the. Um, you know, wrangling of, of things like bug testing and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not terribly hung up on the title 
I mean, I, a lot of the things that I did were taken, you know, from Itoi's writing, and and I will always maintain that you know Itoi San is the mastermind, you know, behind Earthbound, and he's the one that that made it be what it is, um, you know. And what I got to do is is sort of add flavor and and do things that made it so that it worked well for. Um, audiences outside of, of Japan and um, you know I'm just grateful that it seemed to have worked well enough that yeah you know we're still still talking about it all these years later I'm glad we've got you on because going through the game one of my favorite parts was the dialogue and you know, it's just it's so different to any other game I've ever experienced before so yeah I, I, I thought it was really good yeah well, that's great I mean Go Sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, that is that is a toy song. I mean, you know, the thing is, he was a, uh, a a well-known writer in Japan. I mean, he wrote all kinds of different, you know, things from, you know, TV commercials and, and various things like that. So, you know, it, it, it was really, in my opinion, one of the first games to ever use someone who I would term as a highly professional writer as well. Wow. So well, the, di- the dialogue, as we know, is very witty and... Um, yeah, did did you sort of contribute much to that sort of style of writing? Or yeah, because for example, um, I don't know, just it's really hard to pinpoint down a specific moment. But the characters, the way they would speak, was so odd. Did you sort of create that, or sort of contribute to that, or was it sort of more direct translation? Um, well, it kind of depends. I mean, there were times when I did go, sort of get to um, make it as quirky as I sort of felt like I, I wanted to make it and um, I've mentioned it before I mean it's, it's kind of funny when I when I look at the game I mean I think there were some days that I was doing you know sort of some rewriting work where I happened to take it a little farther into the weird sort of category and then other days where I think I played it a little more straight and stuff and so I can almost sort of when I look at different parts of the game see maybe what my mood would have been about that time um, Yeah. so there are certain aspects in the game that I I definitely got to, you know, sort of infuse with a lot of my own sort of, you know, weird sense of humor, you know, jokes or, <laughs> or whatever. But, um, you know, a lot of the stuff still, you know, well, and that's the other thing, too. I mean, the, the game has just got so much text. Um, you know, I got to do a lot, but there was so much text in it. There's still plenty in there that's, you know, very much Itoi, you know, of course. Yeah. So, you know, the the, the thing that, um, that I got to do is... Uh, you know, infuse it with, like I say, that sort of quirky weirdness. And one of the things that um, that I sort of took that from was when I first got the uh, the job to do it, there had been a bit of the game that had, had been translated and uh, localized uh, up until that point. And one of the sort of most iconic lines from the game is the Fuzzy Pickles line. And <laughs> what I did is I used that sort of... Um, you know, tone or, you know, that sort of attitude that sort of came with that fuzzy pickles line and tried to make that carry out throughout the rest of the game. And, you know, and that's a really um, good example of sort of the the localization style that was done. Like in Japanese, when the camera guy comes down out of the sky, he actually tells the, the player to say cheese sandwich. So in Japanese, it ends up being, you know, cheese sandwich, which it, it, it ends up being fine for Japan and for us when uh, the other translator had done this 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 other bit and had picked fuzzy pickles I knew that I could actually sort of use that kind of funny you know moderate change to do that in, in other parts of the game as well so you know it, it really gave me a good guide and it sort of like I say you know set my set, set the tone for me for the rest of the game and 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 then like I say within those boundaries I sort of you know, like I said, one day I think I was probably in a little weirder mood than others, and so some of the stuff is certainly stranger than than the Japanese, but uh, some of it, you know, is 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 a lot more straight too. That's funny that you mentioned having like weirder days. I can relate to that, and I understand <laughs> moments that are in like your game that feel like you were just in a very like you know creative mode i wouldn't even say weird just like one that you really knew you wanted to paint this character very specifically and it, honestly it felt like you went outside the confines of what that original character might have been in the japanese version and um correct me if i'm wrong but three of those characters in particular feel like that to me one is the one person in um it's 
thread, thread, I'm not sure how to pronounce two E's in a row, um, that in the zombie town, right, um, mm-hmm. that uh, when you knock on their door, everyone else is kind of freaking out and won't let you come in. They just go, yeah. eek, a zombie. I'm watching a zombie movie. Can you come back later? And, like, that really, like, it was really evocative to me. And it really brought up a picture of a person, like, you know, watching a movie. And, like, during – it's kind of ironic, right, during this zombie apocalypse going on. So then uh, more importantly, though, there were two characters that were fairly vital to the story. I mean, we could talk about them separately, but there was Dad and fi- the final Escargo Express Man that your sister was working for the entire game. So these two voices come through on your phone, and they describe themselves just by the words that they're saying. Dad worries about you a lot, and he tells you to not work as hard as your mother, but he doesn't explain his absence. And then, you know, the final yeah. Escargo Express Man is talking about. He tells his whole life story. He's like, I, I just had a baby and my wife's taking care of that one while I watch this child. And he kind of does one of those moments that your mom would do on the phone where he says, wait one second, that's dog food. Don't eat that bad. And it's <laughs> cute. Cause it really felt like it's very human. So uh, what was your inspiration for either dad or that final escargo express man? Well, I mean, I think that to be honest with you for those two characters, I mean, I don't think they stray too far from the Japanese in a lot of ways. Um, but the one thing that, um, when it came to your dad, um, I had lived in Japan for four years uh, prior to going and working at Nintendo. And so I was really, you know, much more aware of sort of what a, an, an absent parent is like in Japan um, because I knew a lot of kids that, you know, didn't see their, their dads very often because they would work at their office all day and then they would go and, and, you know, do things with the guys in the office after work. And this was sort of a, a normal thing in Japan. And so for me, um, I wanted to preserve some of that, uh, some of that, that Japanese culture in, in the way the dad was, you know, certainly not there, but, um, I wanted him to be as, uh, supportive and, um, you know everything like that, which in the Japanese he is, um, but I I don't think I don't think I necessarily you know made him as quite as um, I don't know I, I I I kind of always wondered in the Japanese if it was you know sort of a bit more melancholy and mm-hmm. um, it, it's a bit of a of a sad situation in a way for a lot of kids in Japan when they don't see their dad very often. And, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that Itoi put that in was, you know, just a sort of a commentary on Japanese life. And that isn't as nearly as common in the U S as it is in Japan. And so I didn't want it to be too, um, Oh, jarring, I guess for an American audience to sort of, you know, feel like this, this dad is, is almost like abandoned you. So I tried yeah. to make sure that he was as supportive and things like that, but he was always just going to be this voice on the phone. Yeah, that's so really interesting looking at it from different cultures. Like in Japan, that's maybe somebody who's always grown up in Japan would recognize that's what it's meant to be. But me, being Australian, I'm sure this might be similar for you, Mitch. I just assumed that the parents were divorced. I did. Yeah. Yeah. I really. I thought the no, whole time they're actually, that they're actually, that's funny. They're not. You have, like, confirmation from Nintendo, like, when they were telling you, like, the translation of the script, right? They were just like, now it's going to seem like it to you, but the dad is still with the mother in this story. So when it comes to um, the parents, you know, it's it's funny because I don't think I've actually ever had anyone tell me that they thought the parents were divorced. But really? um, I can understand why people would think that. Um, you know, divorce in Japan is actually a lot less common than it is in the U.S. as well. Um, but that being the case, like I say, the dads tend to work long hours and things like that. Um, so a lot of times, you know, kids, like I say, their, their contact with their, their dads is, is a lot less than their mom, certainly. Um, and so in the course of, you know, looking at the game and knowing that it was, you know, obviously a a game that was done in Japan, I had actually, uh, always known that the mom and the dad were, we're not divorced, but it was just that's a sort of a, a, a not unusual situation in Japan for a mom and a dad. Right, and what it reminded me of too was of you know relationships I'd seen in my real life in America, where you know a, a father would talk about a mother that was divorced from himself by saying your mother, and it seemed uh-huh. very specific to say your mother as opposed to uh, mom, right? Mom, yeah. Right. 
Yeah, because that's what right. I would have said. And I, that might also also just be like um, a translation, uh, loss in translation kind of deal, like where this is maybe this is um, this is set in a idyllic Western town. Onet is, but still at the same time, it, I think has to you know interpret as much as it can while still involving all of the Japanese you know family dynamics that exist as is because. Um, yeah, that it just it felt very un-American to know that they're together, and I just I'm very shocked. It's not, not it's nothing. It's just a commentary on the game, you know. It's um it's really interesting to me that it's just such an answer to you because you've lived there that you know they're together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and you know it's it's funny. So so the use of the word mother, I mean I'm not even sure that I've ever ever really mentioned this, but the one thing that I I do remember a couple of times I thought I want to leave the word I want to use the word mother as sort of a mild homage to the mother title in Japanese oh. rather than using the word mom. Interesting. Because mom being, you know, obviously very, you know, colloquial and, and it's your, your, your family and all this kind of thing. I did, there was a couple of times where I thought I could make it mom, but I kind of wanted to leave it as mother. Oh, that's a really and that cool was, story. so that's a, sort of a different thing. No, that's, that's a really interesting Easter egg. And it kind of ties into when Ness is missing his mom and or his mother and um he'll just say he's homesick and it 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 really it it makes me feel more of like back to i think what the original title mother is meant to be more of like a planet earth connected to earth in the universe kind of deal where it feels like you know ness's mother is in, in at least in the english translation of of earthbound Neth's mother is you know maybe a metaphor for that planet earth he misses his home like he misses his life and He's that's out awesome. on these weird alien planets. That's 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 actually like you just blew my mind right there. <laughs> well, and the significance that the, that his mum has at the end when they're praying. You know, yeah. isn't the mother? Unless I'm mistaken, the mother is the last one that they have to pray to to defeat the guy. The gig. I can't say this word. The Geigers. <laughs> yeah. Well. So the so the name. I mean, and I've I've talked about how to pronounce the name, but we can we can touch on that one later when we actually maybe get into yeah. the character a bit more. But but yeah, like the mom. The, the mother character. Um, yeah, she's, you know, she's very much a, like you said, you know, she's a, she's an important part of the whole story because she's the one that was always meant um, to sort of ground you and keep you from, um, you know, getting too uh, caught up in the save the world, save the universe. Um, save the children, sort of save idea. the world. Sorry. I had yeah. To. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it feels like that. It very, does. It does, though. Earthbound often yeah, does. And, well, and that was one where I think you know I actually in the Japanese it, it didn't do this as much, and I and I know this was sort of a, a conscious choice on my part. Right. Is that the mom can be a little bit caustic towards you at times? Yes. And yeah. I actually put that in on purpose, and right. I don't think it was quite like it wasn't quite as as much in the Japanese version. I, I did it because I really wanted the player to feel like, you know, as you're traveling throughout all of these sort of interesting exotic places and you're doing more and more stuff and you're fighting big monsters and you're going through all this stuff that when you end up talking to your mom, I wanted that to be this <laughs> very um, sort of jarring, like, Oh geez, you know, she's actually talking to me like I'm just a kid still. And I didn't, I didn't want the game to stray too far into this you're the superhero thing. I kind of wanted it to to keep that that bit of I'm, I'm still you know I, I'm I'm still just a home hometown kid too. Um, so yeah. actually, I do know that I, I did definitely put in some of those things where the mom was like, "Yeah, whatever," kind of stuff. You know, right. yeah, sure, you're cool, whatever. And just and I love that, you, that is oh, sorry, Mitch. Yeah, just while we're on the topic of like you know what's symbolic about each character and you know what they represent, I'm I'm also interested too in two characters. There are um, two moments when uh, a tribesman and a Mister Saturn, who's also kind of part of a tribe, they they have you sit down to drink tea, and that feels you know innately very Japanese to sit down and relax and enjoy a long cup of tea, and then it goes into this very interesting. Um, almost Star Wars <laughs> crawl where it just like slowly moves up and just tells you what you're doing and it gives you a context for the game. Uh, what was that translation like? That's that had to have been very difficult to go from uh, whatever the you know original you know heroic message might have been there to what I felt was a very touching and very moving story of a 13 year old boy who just is so scared and lost and you know doesn't know what to do. 
Well, you know, in the Japanese, I mean, there really was a lot of 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 that in the the actual original Japanese as well. I mean, it was he, you know, Itoi San when he wrote a, a lot of his stuff, he has a very um you know, strong sense, I think, of of sort of family and, and you know, emotional sort of uh, uh, phraseology and things like that. And so I think a lot of that actually was in the Japanese. And, and you know, so so doing that kind of work and taking it from, you know, the original Japanese to, to what we ended up with, I don't, you know, those parts I don't remember being terribly difficult. I mean, those are the ones that, um, you know, I sort of felt like... Uh, you know, had had kind of written themselves. I don't. You know, those those were the parts that were never really difficult. You know, to be honest with you, the humor and stuff like that was the hardest thing. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, that makes sense though, because there's a lot of very specific jokes too that I think that only an American <laughs> audience would get. And I I think a lot of them went over my head, but I know that there are meant to be a lot of B horror movie references here about alien invasions, probably body snatcher stuff, like everywhere. And I don't know that I've seen enough of those in my age, you know, being 22, as much as perhaps the original audience might have gotten it in America, as limited as that was. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, some of those sort of alien references and stuff were actually... Um, some of those were in the Japanese stuff as well, because like uh-huh. Itoi is, is was very much a fan of, um, you know, like pop culture and right. that kind of thing. Right. And and a part of that, a part of that whole pop pop culture bit is, you know, things like schlocky sort of you know space movies and and this kind of stuff. And I think for Itoi san growing up, you know, through sort of the late sixties into the seventies and and stuff like that. I think he saw, you know, a number of those, those sort of movies. And I think that was a part of what helped him inspire him with the story as well. So, um, you know, but it, it was, it was hard to sort of take a joke that in Japanese was, you know, drawing on, you know, whether it was a cultural thing in Japan or whether it was a play on words or whatever, or a pun or something like that. And then have to come up with something in English that, would hopefully still be funny. And that, like I said, that was the part that was the most um, stressful in a way for me, just because I was kind of worried that everything I did would end up sounding really hacked or stupid or, you know, or it was something that would be funny to me and nobody else kind of thing, you know? Um, yeah. But thankfully, I I guess that. It worked. Oh, sorry. Continue. No, go ahead. Well, with, uh, you said a toy song grew up in the sixties and seventies and that was, well, the sixties was when the Beatles were most present. And there's a specific joke in the game when, uh, he asks what Beatles song starts with, or sorry, starts with today, and then the answer says yes or no. Was that a joke that you put in specifically, or was that sort of his influence from um, from the Beatles in that time well, era? So, so, so this is another interesting sort of small bit. Is that that was actually another little thing that I didn't write the yesterday joke. Now that exact joke wasn't the same as it was in Japanese. Now, it was a Japanese Beatles reference um, joke or whatever, but it was for a different song and and it was uh. it was slightly different. And so, the guy who had done Fuzzy Pickles also did that joke. And again, it's sort of the same thing. It, it, it's really, I, I remember those two things, that joke in particular and the Fuzzy Pickles thing being the, the two things that when I saw his... Uh, his initial work, I thought, okay, we can kind of go crazy here, and we can we can take things that were in the Japanese and change them enough to English that you know they're not going to be bothered by, um, you know, something that's really literal and and you know like that I have to do something literal, and and that was what you know gave me the confidence to sort of go off script a, a bit every once in a while. Well, that's interesting yeah. too because you were mentioning that. These Beatles songs references because I know there's more, and I'm, Jack and I are probably like, go a little bit more in depth in that in our review. But the Beatles in particular seem to be a mom- seem to be a very um, specific niche that rumored, and I think this has been shot down a couple times. But I wanted the, like the final authority from you know maybe a better source than Wikipedia. Um, whether or not the the pop culture references specifically like the Beatles were the ones that held back Nintendo doing a. Um, perhaps a sequel uh, localization, you know, from other three it is as it is in Japan, or um, even just really releasing it on the Wii Virtual Console. Was there any credit to that? Um, well, so uh, the only thing I, I would be able to tell you is that I wasn't 
privy to any of that really because I had been gone from I've been gone from Nintendo since 1995 or something like that, mm-hmm. and so it's been a long time since I was there. And anything that they talked about as to why they did or didn't, you know, either do a sequel, you know, do the Mother Three release here, or um, even why it took so long to you know re-release the game, um, it would be purely speculative on my part. Now I. I, I'm going to be honest. I don't put a ton of weight in that stuff because, um, I mean, the the thing that the thing that for me, having gone through the work on Earthbound and then having the game come out, and the fact that it didn't sell as well as it was supposed to, um, to be honest with you, I think that was kind of the biggest um, right. The biggest thing is is that, that that kept them from doing a sequel or anything else. It was just purely a matter of economics. Um, but that's speculative on my part. Um, but, but I do, you know, from what I know of, of having worked there and what I know of, you know, sort of big business and things like that. I mean, they, you know, any big business wants a, a, a healthy return on any investment. And, uh, you know, I know that when Earthbound came back, uh, came out, they didn't think that they got the, you know, unfortunately the heavy... Uh, heavy return on investment that they were hoping for. So I don't, yeah. So personally, I, I don't, I think that that was something that a lot of people sort of looked at and and wanted to find a reason for why they wouldn't re-release it. It's not nearly as exciting as saying, well, it just never sold well enough. And so they just weren't that interested in, in, you know, jumping in with uh, a bunch of money again. Yeah, I suppose it's not as sexy as the answer of it didn't sell as well because everyone seems to know that. So it's funny because I'm, I can't wait to we get to the gigas part because there's going to be a theory that I'm hoping you can shoot down for me there. But it seems like the the, the it, can we call it the Starman fandom? Have you found out the official name, like what they call themselves? Is it just Earthbound fandom? Like, is there a name? Um, like? Well, I mean, you know, the, the I mean, the, there's the website that that's the Starman.net right. website that uh, has sort of been the central place for for Earthbound fans for many many years. Um, and then, you know, they, uh, as a part of the starman.net, uh, website is, uh, they've got earthbound central, which is another place that has a lot of interesting information about, uh, earthbound and, and things like that. But, you know, earthbound fandom, I don't know. I don't know if there's a, an official, you know, special name for them or not. No, no, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they'll make one eventually. Maybe after listening to this, they will, but yeah, uh, back to my original question then. So. This 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 fandom likes likes to you know seem to create these really in depth theories for moments that were um, really tiny and I mean uh, maybe you wouldn't even had touched on this yet because this was it's a very specific moment and I'd be very impressed if you can remember back to it but there's a moment when as ESERB seems to uh, insinuate uh, the, you know the reading uh, association in America and as many fans like to associate that there was a zombie prostitute I'm not sure if prostitute is the correct term there but there was a zombie prostitute that for some reason decides to lock you up in a in a, in a um, hotel room yeah the, it, not even a hotel room it's um <laughs> you're at the hotel and they, they bring you down to like this dungeon in the graveyard I mean without any dialogue oh, right. about who that person was and like why they're there that part it, it feels like a glitch to me not a glitch it just feels like a bump in the road that part of the story and i never i can't grasp personally what happens there and why that character decides to do that and is there any more insight you can give me as to as to who that character was and their motivations or is it just as simple as master belch just wanted to put ness away before he could kill him or something you know and uh, i'm i'm going to tell you this is probably one of those cases where i don't remember exactly yeah yeah what or why you know that character was the way she was and um you know one of the things i've I've told people before is that you know i some some of some of the time i was well a lot of the time i was doing a lot of the translation work sort of just off of paper and and in a sort of in the dark almost and so i may have just easily you know, gone through that translation work, and I didn't even. I don't, I'm not even sure if I knew what was going to be going on on the screen, and that it was a, you know, a zombie female or whatever. But right. um, so I, yeah, I mean, I wish I could give you a better answer than that. But I, this is one of those cases where I don't really remember what may have happened, and and it and it could have been one of those times where because I didn't have all of the context that maybe the translation was a little, you know, 
wonky in the end. No, I mean, it, it, I, I felt that Paula's message to Jeff there, you know, kind of transitioning into more of like Paula and Jeff and the side characters, that I think Paula's message was very clear there. I mean, it's nothing, nothing on you, and I think it falls maybe more on the hands of the original script that it wasn't described in depth what was happening there, and it just felt like a weird, you know, mechanism to get Jeff into the story. Because, yeah, because Paula has a really nice message to Jeff where she's just like, I don't, I know you don't know me yet, but you need to come save me, head south. And, I mean, that language was very specific so that I knew even where to head as Jeff. It was, yeah, it was, it was exactly nice. what to do, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there yeah. are a lot of moments that, um, that I, I'd love to touch on as we go about this that I needed instructions from a character. And uh, translation or not, I have to give, you know, a, a, a great praise to the script for teaching me where I had to go without really ha- having too much exploration on my hand. As in, if I paid attention to the dialogue, I was okay. I would know where to go next. And it was great. It was, I felt like I wasn't handheld. I felt like I was just given enough to spur my curiosity. So if you had yeah, any and, hand and in with, that part, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, with that, Marcus, as well, did you have, because you mentioned before you sort of influenced we had influence on how you wanted to have the mother be towards Ness. Did you have that with any other characters? For example, like with Ness and Paula, their relationship was sort of subtly hinted at throughout the story, but then sort of almost confirmed at the end. Like, was that something that was in the, like the English or the Japanese uh, game? Or did you sort of add that into the English one because you sort of wanted it to be there? Um, so in terms of a relationship between Ness and Paula, um, I don't remember if there was stuff in the Japanese that sort of hinted at that kind of, there may very well have been, but the one thing I know I did change when it came to Paula and I did this, um, sort of, you know, and and there will be people I'm sure that will be sort of frustrated that I even did this. Um, (laughs) but there's a a moment, yeah. There's a moment when uh, Paula is in in jail, and she, she in what I ended up having her say was something about you know um, I'm glad you came and 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 rescued me because I was going to have to break out of here or something like that. And in the Japanese, it actually said something like um, I'm glad you came and got me because I was going to start to cry or something like that. And I remember that I purposefully changed her character from being um, a sort of what I considered even, you know, back then sort of a, a weak female character. I wanted her to be a little more um, forceful and a little more willing to uh, make it sound like she was going to take her own destiny in her own hands. Um, And one of the reasons I did that, well, there's a number of reasons why I did that. Um, One of them was because when I lived in Japan for the four years, um, you know, Japan's culture is different than American culture in the way the men and the women act. And women tend to be, and you can even still see this today, women tend to be in a lot of, t- a lot of times pretty sort of cute and sort of cutesy. And a lot of times I sort of felt like it was just put on and not, you know, like, like they, they worked really hard to try to be cute. And after four years living there, I kind of gotten tired of it. And I really wanted, you know, when I came back to America, to just be around women that were, you know, sort of a lot more confident and that kind of thing, I guess. Um, and so when I, when I had the character of Paula there, I wanted to make sure that for an American audience, she didn't sound like she was just some weak little girl. And I wrote her to have a little more backbone than what she did in the Japanese. And also because I had a daughter and things like that. And I didn't want, you know, like when my daughter, you know, I grew up, I I don't think I really thought about her ever playing the game, but, you know, I wanted to portray females as capable and, you know, strong and not, you know, relying just on a guy to save her all the time. Yeah, and and it's interesting, too, that you made Paula, I mean, as we're admitting here, that she's not just the love interest for Ness. She's more empowered than that. She is... She's, to me, the almighty spellcaster of this story. Ness tries to take it over in the end by just, you know, absorbing the universe's power and gaining all of this um, PP so he can use maybe more spells, but, or, or, you know, Psy. But Paula's felt like the most strong throughout the game, and I was relying on her for, like, the bulk of the fight. And I think that that finally came through, as you're saying, in the dialogue in specific ways. I saw there were points where... 
I would be like, oh my god, are you kidding me? Like, Paula's really, like, been trapped again? Like, she would just escape. And I learned from <laughs> the dialogue that I think you specifically tuned it into. It made more sense to me because Paula was letting herself be kidnapped uh, at times because she didn't want to fight back against the person. She felt bad for them. They were under the control of these Manny statues and she didn't want to hurt them. Like she had the ability to, but she wasn't going to because she was a kind soul. And just because she's so strong and powerful doesn't mean that she's going to be, um, you know, a, a murderous person. She's also not a damsel in distress though. I think you really, you found like a really nice niche for Paula to fit in, in this story. And it really, it really struck a chord with me. I, I appreciate Paula a lot more than I thought I was going to as, um, yeah. I was first getting into the story. And Mitch, I knew you, I knew you were going to bring this up because you love the female characters in games, especially ones that are strong and are breaking the stereotype in that sense. Yeah, like, you know, Samus and whatnot. I mean, yeah. uh, I, had Metroid been out, uh, Marcus, when you were playing through? And uh, I, I'm assuming you played through at least or, you know, read more of the script of Earthbound? Um, well, Matt, Metroid had been out, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't, you know, I wasn't really thinking about Metroid too much when, when I was doing this. You know, like I said, I, I, I just know that when we got to the point where we were doing a lot of, you know, Paula bits and, and Paula lines and things like that. Like I said, I I knew that Ness was going to be, um, you know, easily identifiable as this, uh, you know, sort of classic hero, the the world saver and all that kind of thing. And I didn't want, um, I didn't I didn't want her to, like I say, be just uh, a sidekick that that had little to do with. Um, moving the story forward and things like that. And, and for an American audience, I didn't think that the girls, because, because I actually did believe that there would be a lot of females playing the game. Mm -hmm. um, we knew that it had been popular in Japan with a wide audience. Um, it had, it had actually sold, you know, very solid units in, in Japan. And we knew that it was uh, a game that appealed to a lot of people. So I had always sort of expected that there would be a lot of girls playing the game. And so I just knew that American girls hopefully would appreciate the fact that I wanted them to be, uh, I wanted the girls to be, uh, yeah, you know, just, just a bit more confident, a bit more, uh, forceful than, than what you would normally have gotten maybe from some of the writing. Cause I think, you know, that that's one thing like Itoi san, um, you know, he wrote from a Japanese perspective. And so the girls were, were sort of portrayed in a certain way. And, uh, and, and that is absolutely one thing that I, fully admit that I tweaked a bit towards more towards an American style of female. Well, I don't hear complaints here, huh? Yeah, so <laughs> great that you did That's that because there's still a problem in gender with gender equality in video games to this day, you know. So it's great that you oh, did yeah. that back then. Well, yeah, and I mean, it's 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 kind of, it, it's a little disappointing in a way that it is still something that we deal with. But, um, you know, at the same time, I'm glad that I, you know, took that that tack when I when I had a chance. And I'm sure you wish you could have at least changed the text of frying pan because that was a little bit disgusting to me. frying pan. That she has a frying pan that she hits things with. I didn't even like that when I saw that movie Tangle. I, th I thought that, that was just too atypical of, I mean, the typical um, interpretation of a woman belongs in the kitchen kind of deal. And just, I, I didn't understand why a weapon would be a frying pan, a yo-yo either. Mitch, Peach right? does but that in Smash Bros. <laughs> No, Peach is about? a different story, and I was going to compare Paula to Peach, <laughs> and I was and, and I was and I was going to tell you, Marcus, that I wish that you know Nintendo had picked up. We had changed it, right? Not even that, just like that. You know, uh, Paula was able to become more uh, prevalent in pop culture, a la Peach, and making a stronger female lead for a lot of the Nintendo games. That would have been great. I would have been excited to see you know this uh, girl in a pink dress beating at people with. I don't know, a sword or something, right? I don't know, they don't have swords in this game too often. Or, or Ness is bad, no, why couldn't they both yeah, have bats, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and and I agree with you. I mean, you know, especially now, I mean, I I, I agree. I wish I, I wish I would have gone in and changed uh, the frying pan to something else. I'm trying to remember if there's any graphics of an actual frying pan anywhere in the game. I was looking because really was, hard for it, and I couldn't find any. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, because that would have been the only, you know... right changing graphics in the game and we did that a bit for the US market. Right. was always sort of the thing we tried to avoid because that always involved then an artist and depending on what we were changing it could be, you know, multiple frames of animation and things like that and become a lot bigger job than just a simple little tweak. 
Um, so we tried to avoid changing art as much as possible. And if the frying pan had been in, that would have been one reason why we didn't necessarily change it. But I think it was probably, to be honest, just an oversight on my part to, you know, it's like I was I was sort of up with the, uh, you know, strong female character to some point, but didn't quite get all the way to 100 percent is the is the problem I think I had. Well, progress was made. And, we and I would have liked it. <laughs> well, that's good. I, I would I would, you know, today I would change it probably to. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, whether it would be. I don't know, give her a blowgun or anything that's cooler right. than, you know, a frying pan. Because it's not like any other character had, like, a gender-specific item, and it's not that a frying pan is innately feminine, but in the context of the of a weapon, I think it might have to be, because if a woman's holding a frying pan, it's assumed that's because, oh, she was in the kitchen cooking and just happened to, you know, have to smack someone over the head with it, because, yeah, I don't know, it was just, it was odd, and I, I mean, I didn't blame you at all, even, even in my questioning of why that was there. I thought that, well, that was I... just... Is that, is that from the original Japanese text that she has a frying pan? Oh, it yeah. just makes it even yeah. a bit more odd because Paula isn't even seen as a cook. You know, she works at a daycare. Like they could have had any weapon that would relate to her being in that um, in that in that profession, but it wasn't. It was a frying pan, so it just makes it even more um, offensive in that matter. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I I think I'll I'll have to you know take. A... <laughs> I'll have to take some responsibility for that. It's okay. We'll forgive you. <laughs> Thanks. We'll forgive you. <laughs> so I know Mitch wants wants me to ask this, but Mitch also wants you know wants to know the answer as well. Well, you, you already said that you've been influencing sort of different characters, different relationships, and stuff. Well, we meant to read a bit into the Jeff and Tony relationship, especially with Tony's letter at the end of the game, because yeah. yeah, as as we mentioned, we was, there was sprinkled in stuff with with Ness and Paula. But what about these two? You know, it's it's kind of funny. Um, when I was doing the work, I don't think I ever looked at that relationship of Tony and Jeff as, you know, being anything, you know, different than sort of a a underclassman who sort of, you know, looks up to an older guy who, you know, at the same school that that he really admires. But I know that um, Itoi-san has said that um, that Jeff, well, not Jeff, but Tony, is supposed to be a gay character. And you know, thankfully, when I when I sort of did that last you know pass on his letter and stuff like that, um, I don't. I, I think I decided to leave it as sort of. Um, as affectionate as, as as it was, I think intended to be in in Japanese. Now, I I I was a big fan when I was doing the translation work. This is another thing that I that I did a lot, as much as I could anyway. Was I didn't have any issues with being subtle about stuff, and I liked sort of the ambiguity of certain things in the game. Um, one of these, and I and I think you know when when that letter was there, and I and I remember you know going through it and and doing that work, I remember kind of thinking, gee, I wonder if anybody's going to take this the wrong way. And I kind of thought, well, you can take it a lot of different ways. And however it gets taken, I'm not going to be too concerned about it. I mean, if somebody wants to think that he's in love with Jeff, I, you know, I was okay with that too. I mean, I didn't really mind, but I didn't want it to be, you know, so, you know, blatant that there wasn't any sort of thought in your mind as to, gee, what do I really think is, is going on? I wanted, I wanted things to be um, subtle and, and sort of thought provoking and that kind of stuff in a lot of ways in, in the game as much as I could sort of you know work that stuff in I, I liked that part of the the work I did. Well, sometimes it's better to leave it subtle so it leaves it up to the player's imagination and it sort of makes it more personal to them how they view the characters. Well, so yeah. it's good that I think it's better that you did it that way. Me too, and it didn't even take me up into the letter to realize that. That's just kind of what put the nail in the coffin for Jeff Tony. But I think what really sold me is just the context at the beginning, the way that it opens, the way it's written, you know, like that the blocking is. It's just that, um, you know, Tony wakes up when Jeff is, and it just seems really concerning and doting. And it's not in a sexual way that they're in the same bedroom or anything, you know, kind of dirty. It's it's more of a – it's an affection. You're right. There's a, there's a certain affection that Tony has for Jeff, and he really does seem to miss him a lot. And that letter – 
brings it back really home when he, when he just says, "Don't show this to anyone else," because that just seems like the atypical, like you know, elementary school crush thing that you would do. Like just write to someone a note and just say, but "You can't tell anyone." And it just it was really cute and it was it was innocent and and I appreciated it. So so thank you for Jeff Tony. I appreciate for um, your your maintaining of Tony's character as it was in that. Oh, and I love I mean, how subtle, subtle. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, yeah, like I said, I love how you made it that subtle because in video games and TV shows and even books and stuff, I hate being spoon fed like exactly what's meant to be taken. Like I love sort of getting the hints, getting like the spark, and then sort of myself creating the world around that. And so it's great that you did it that way, and I think that a lot of fans would have appreciated it. Well, that's good. I, you know the the one the one thing with Tony and Jeff that I just remember thinking, you know this this one act in, informs sort of their relationship to me was having having that moment where Tony lets Jeff climb over him to get out mm-hmm. and that was the part where I just I think I wanted to make sure that um, you know that sort of now I don't know what the word is exactly I, I, I guess you know, I wanted to make sure that Jeff just seemed like he was, you know, wholly devoted um, to, you know, being a helper or, a, you know, someone that is, you know, just very much the, like I said, I, I sort of viewed him as the, the, the younger underclassman who wants the approval of Jeff, you know, for whatever reason you want to want to ascribe um and so let him letting him you know use use him as a step stool is sort of the thing that i thought okay that sort of embodies what i sort of see as you know the jeff and and tony relationship is that you know tony is just really looking for um you know approval and you know all of that kind of thing so yeah i i didn't i didn't want to i didn't want to downplay that stuff but i didn't want to turn it into a big deal either like i said i just you know, I, I wanted it to be, you know, as subtle and 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 innocent and uh, sort of. I don't want to say obscure, but you know, flexible. I guess is maybe a good word for it. You know, some like you say, you know, you you can read this and you can sort of interpret it as you want, and that's kind of what I really wanted. That's good, and I think that there's another line that Jeff says that actually just reminded me of exactly what you were talking about. That uh, Jeff doesn't seem to be competition for Paula. Uh, that he, you know, would want to get uh, with Paula as opposed to Ness. In that, there's a line where he's just like, "When you two get married one day, I want to like be around to fix your things." <laughs> and it's not like right. um, Ness, you better watch out. I'm coming after Paula. And I mean, it doesn't have to be that he's just not <laughs> interested in Paula. I think that he's just not interested in, in women in my interpretation. And that's how I went along with it. And I was, I was happy. I think that that um, that Jeff really uh, seemed like he was in a good place in the end because. He just he seemed to set out what he was doing, and maybe he'll miss Tony for a bit. But Tony prayed for him during the Gigas battle, so I'm sh- I'm sure that they're still they're still you know using their um, the the telekinetic powers that these kids do in this game to still chat with each other, or sending each other letters somehow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's like I said, I'm glad that that you know, and and again, like you said, with Earthbound fans, it's great the way they sort of fill in the the parts that that need filling in, you know, and. Uh, and that the stuff is open ended enough for people to interpret as they want. That's you know, I'm glad that I'm glad that that, that worked out. And to sort of turn this discussion on a complete three sixty, something that wasn't subtle in the game, which I'm curious about how this made it into the final cut, is when in Pooh's test, when the the description of tearing off the limbs and the ears and everything, like that was not subtle. That was very <laughs> Yeah. Very intense. Like, how did that make it into the game, and how did it make it sort of at a KA rating? Like, was that something that well, was in the Japanese version, or was that something that you um, sort of put in the to describe it that graphically? No, it was it was certainly in the Japanese version. And you know, the other thing that um, you you kind of have to, to to know about is that twenty years ago, the rating system and the ESRB and all that kind of stuff was like brand new. And, and I think what happened was, you know, for a lot of us when we were uh, in that, like when I worked at Nintendo and, and it was just at the beginning of this period where, um, you know, parents were getting concerned about what 
you know, was being portrayed in video games and things like that. So much of it was focused on the graphics. And, you know, this was, you know, a, a sort of a time when Mortal Kombat was, you know, just coming out. And it was sort of the, the most notorious game at that time just because of large amounts of blood and all of this kind of stuff and it being in the game. Sure. Um, yeah. And so the thing with the ESRB was for, honestly, I think for me, I'm, I'm fairly certain that I did a lot of the preparation of screenshots and stuff like that. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I have a feeling I took all the stuff that I thought would be questionable visually and sent all that stuff in and and any part in the the game that mentioned uh you know anything like well we knew that if there was going to be anything like smoking or drinking or whatever we had to send that in so we changed all that stuff um to to make sure that it was ka but you know uh, uh the text you know very you know, like you said you know sort of graphic violence of the text to be honest with you i probably just missed sending it in and back in those days, nobody went through and played the whole game, you know, at the ESRB and stuff. I think yeah. they just trusted that you were giving them everything. And so, it, to be honest with you, I don't know that that would have really changed it from KA necessarily. But I suppose it's always possible. I suppose somebody could have said, you know, this this is a little too too rough for young kids. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, just like the, the cult, the- you know, you said something that was visually visually graphic. I think the cult, um, you know, the insane this happy happy village part that was i think that was visually quite um confronting different definitely right. wasn't you know um comfortable to look at for my for me at least <laughs> yeah you know that was one that we tried to sort of soften a little bit um you know we did change some of the graphics on those characters you know the the little santa claus fuzzy white ball at the end of their hat that was put on just for north america um, oh really? And, yeah, and we took the HH off the front because when I looked at it, the H looked a little too close to a K. Yeah, and, and that's something that, that I think that yeah. a, a lot of players would definitely feel that that's where their mind mind to go to first. But I'm a I'm a oh, yeah. nineteen year old like I, I call myself a man, nineteen year old boy, and I still get a little. I, I got very surprised going into the. Um, the center of Happy Happy Village, like in the house where they're all, all of the cult, um, the members are sort of together. That was very, you know, surprising to me. Yeah, yeah. It 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 was a part of the game that, um, you know, for for us when we were working on it. I mean, I like I said, I, I wanted them to take the HH off the hat, which they did, and then we talked about some way to try to soften the image, you know, from being quite so clannish and we, but we didn't want to make huge wholesale changes to the graphics because it was, you know, it would change the story a ton because everything about that story is sort of the blue, blue thing. And so the outfits are all blue and, um, you know, they are cultists and all this kind of thing. And we, we ended up, like I say, going with the little snowball at the end of the, the cap to hopefully sort of, keep people from just automatically looking at it and saying, well, these are a bunch of Klansmen. Um, and it looks like a Klan meeting. Um, but, you know, we, we knew that that was certainly uh, something that, you know, is easy to see when you look at it that way. Yeah, for sure. But it, like I said, for the, for the, for the cost reasons and, and, and various things like that, we thought, well, maybe we can get away with it. And, and, and you know, and I thought, well, if, if, if there, I knew that there were going to be certain aspects of the game that weren't necessarily um, comfortable for people, but that didn't bother me too much. I kind of wanted people to, you know, occasionally get out of their comfort zone. And in this case, there was, yeah, some some reasons to sort of feel like it was not as comfortable for people as other times. Well, that makes sense too because I think that it's probably a bit stronger for an American audience to see. You know anything that represents um, anything of a clan in general, not even you know having to represent the Ku Klux Klan, and, and that makes sense too that it would um, have the same representation for the Japanese audience. And it's it's also of note too that pretty much all of the bad guys, like the um, leaders of the groups and towns, as there seem to be a lot of, they don't feel bad. They feel like they were manipulated. They feel like 
they always come to be like you know how I was describing Paula treats them like they're not bad they just kidnapped her because they had to they were under the influence of Gigas and you know all this stuff so it's um, interesting to me that they were written that way did you have an influence in creating those characters those um, you know town leaders as being more soft or was that also part of the original script you know that was that was definitely in the original script um, they had been written in so that uh, they were yeah definitely under the influence uh, of Gigas and that and that all of these enemies you know whether they were the um, oh I don't know the, the 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 new age retro hippie for example or you know the cranky lady and all of these various uh, enemies that you fight along the way it was it was really definitely meant to be you fighting them but you know like it, it like it says in the game you never actually kill them you know um, they just come back to their senses and things like that and so you know that was that was one thing that that was a part of the game that I actually was was happy about is that you know I didn't have to have this character um, you know using baseball bats on people and stuff like that and then having them die but rather they just go back to normal and so I was actually happy that 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 was you know the way the game was written and things like that yeah talking about how the game was like written and stuff how much creative control did you have over the specific names of of characters and stuff because as we see with some of the um, enemies you've got annoying old party man extra cranky lady insane cultist mad taxi psychic psycho you know there's heaps of odd ones in there did you sort of get to create them or was that sort of they were sort of you know how they were in the Japanese uh, game. Um, so, in in a lot of cases, uh, what we ended up doing is we did try to keep it to some degree similar to what maybe what it was in in Japanese. But there was there was a me like a, I think we took an afternoon and it was me and a guy named Scott Pelland who was the editor of Nintendo Power magazine, and then uh, Dan Osen who was the guy that actually did the early bit of translation uh, before the project was passed over to me um, we sat down and I remember we we just kind of took the time to look at the art for each of these enemies and and then kind of came up with a sort of goofy funny name that we felt would you know work for that character and and the the guy who was um, also a, a localization director, and I think that was actually my title was localization director in one of my credits. Anyway, me and, and another guy that had worked on the game in Japan um, was with us, and he was explaining to us all of the sort of subtleties and the nuances of, of some of the names and, and things in, in Japanese. And he uh, he was the one that sort of helped us understand, okay, like, like you know the the well, as I pronounce it, the trillionage sprout. You know, <laughs> it's supposed to be a very old plant, and so we trillion in age, talking, yeah. but yeah, exactly. It just says trillion age plant was just sort of the the way we we came up with the name for that, and you know, and then we just always pronounced it like trillionage, so because it sort of mm. sounds like a plant that way. Um, but yeah, and and so we we had a lot of uh, leeway. Um, and some of the names weren't exactly the same. Like, I think some of the names, to be honest with you, in Japanese were kind of more boring than the ones that we came up with. Because I think we were in this mode of making things kind of goofy and funny. And so a lot of those names that, that you see in there, like the annoying old party man and stuff like that, I think in Japanese it's something a lot more tame than that. And we just, like I said, I think it was one of those cases of three of us sitting around and just, sort of trying to come up with something goofier than the, than the last suggestion. And so we, we kind of ended up with what we got for a lot of those names. Cool. Well, it's cool that you had such a thought process behind making those names, because I can imagine just kind of plugging in whatever name, but I think that I'm going to remember these characters, these little enemies forevermore because they had such specific names. And it's, it's really interesting that I can just think of like, 
you know, ones that were named like abstract art and it had like the melted painting or there was even a melted clock that I can't remember the name of, but that just on, on another note reminded me of another artistic painting. There were, I mean, back to some of these artistic references here and pop culture references. I, I do see those in the names and it, it was really fun to be able to follow through and, and to learn too what the, what the level of the enemy I was fighting was just from its name too. Like there's one that's, um, Manly Fish and Manly Fish's brother. <laughs> but Manly Fish isn't very difficult, but all of a sudden his brother comes on by. And, like, when you see his brother, like, you see the word, the word brother, it installed fear in me because he was so much stronger. And it's just, I don't know, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was odd how specific that was that I just still got it. Like, all right, that's like his older brother. I get it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that was a case where, you know, I'm pretty sure that that would have been what it was in Japanese. And we, we, left it as brother because it, it just worked really well I think in English as, as well but but yeah I mean depending on you know which character it is there were some that probably strayed a little farther than the Japanese name and then others that were you know like I say a lot closer and, and stuff but uh, yeah you know like Manly Fish I, I have no idea what that would have been in Japanese but you know it it was one of those things like I say that we sat around and sort of figured out ah, that sounds funny and it works well it's you know, it's a, it's a fish that stands up and is fighting you. So, <laughs> worked out. I, actually, this is a question I perhaps should have asked before. Um, have you played through Earthbound, um, and if so, which local, localization and about how many times? Have I played through Earthbound? Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, no. <laughs> I actually have never actually played the game front to back. I've played parts of it, but I've never sat down and actually played the whole game. Right, Man, it would take I should a while. do that someday, <laughs> and I should do that someday. But at, at, yeah, you know, I mean, even after twenty years, I'm not sure that. It, it, but it is, it is actually fun. The times that I've played, you know, bits and things like that. I, I mean, I'll see stuff that, you know, spurs a memory of why I did what I did when I wrote something, or or what it was about the Japanese that was interesting, or something. So, you know, I really would love to sit down and, and sit and play, but you know, it is a lot of hours, unfortunately. It is, and you know what would be interesting if you were to do some kind of um, capture card version of it from the Wii U Virtual Console now that that's out, and um, if you were to sh- live stream it on Twitch with a like, commentary of things, like little tidbits, kind of like a director's commentary, and I think that that would have been really interesting, and it- it's it's funny because um, I-, I, don't, I don't know the legality of doing the commentary. That's, that's probably a different beat than the Earthbound book that never was. So um, whether or not the commentary is of your interests, I you were very vocal about wanting to put out a book about the production of Earthbound, the, you know, Mother 2. Um, so why exactly did Nintendo shut you down from publishing this book, and what would have this book contained specifically? Well, so I, I definitely did want to do a playthrough, and I did want to include uh, as many thoughts as I could and, and have that sort of running commentary in the book where, you know, did you know? I, I intended to do a full playthrough. You know, highlight any lines or any bits that I, you know, remembered as having some, you know, significance or whatever, um, and go through and talk about that kind of stuff. Like, you know, I knew that I wanted to talk about things like, you know, wh- why Paul is the way she is and, and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I and the the reason that that they didn't want me to write the book. I mean, they, they pretty much just, you know, I, I went to them and asked if, if it would be okay if I did this and they ended up just telling me, you know, that they would rather I didn't. And, you know, out of respect to Nintendo and the fact that, you know, even though it's been a lot of years since I worked there, you know, they, they really helped me get into the game business and things. Um, I decided to go ahead and, and, you know, and honor their wishes and, and not do the book in the end. But, you know, it was just kind of too bad that, that, I didn't get to in a, in a way because it's still seems like there's, you know, a lot of questions and a lot of interest, you know, that comes up around the game and things that are in it. And it would have been kind of fun to answer some of that stuff, but you know, the opposite side of that is uh, again, going back to the sort of subtlety idea. I don't mind the fact that everything isn't automatically understood by people. So, you know, answering questions about all this stuff is is fine. I, I actually, when I first decided to start talking a bit about Earthbound, which had been, you know, many years after I'd worked on it. Um, in fact, it's probably only in the last, whatever, two or three years that I actually have ever really talked about Earthbound. Um, 
you know, I, I really questioned whether I should. Not necessarily because of Nintendo or anything like that, but rather a part of me liked the fact that there were questions and that the fan community, um, you know, enjoyed talking about it and speculating and thought about all these things. And I didn't, I didn't really want to stop that stuff from happening by telling people, oh, no, this is exactly the way it is and this is what it meant and this is what it was and anything else is wrong. I mean, I, I, I like yeah. the fact that I like the fact that people interpret it the way they do. And I respect that as well, your decision in that, because even like over 10 years later, well, no, n- not 10 years later. When was this game released? Yeah, over 10 years 20, later. Yep. 20 years later, even. <laughs> well, 20. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's actually 20 years in June, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Like the, this fandom and this series is still kept alive despite there being the lack of games. And that is a testament to Smash Brothers. I don't know how up to date you are with the video games, but um, like how Lucas is now going to be re released as a character in the latest Smash Bros. game. Like the, the, the Nintendo is purposely keeping this fandom alive because it's what it wants. So, and and that's the thing that is a very good that you sort of left up to imagination because I don't think I don't think that would this would have happened if you had or if the game had answered all the questions at once. I think the the good thing about keeping that there being some mystery is that we get, you know, 20 years later, people still talking about the game. And I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it amazes me. Like I said, I just, I, I can't for the life of me. I would have, I would have never thought that, you know, people would have been interested. Like I say, 20 years later, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to guess that, uh, that people wanted to hear. Yeah. About character names or lines in the game or any of that kind of stuff. And I suppose you could say we're falling on the coattails of all of that because I can't say that we've obviously been fans for 20 years given that I was, um, yeah, two years old when the game first came out. But I, I yeah, definitely... Yeah, this game came out maybe like five months before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is not a... Yeah. Which is not an intent to make you feel old, Marcus, at all. It's just a fact. That's all right. <laughs> no, it's 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 a fact of the the matter that this game is you know held its its uh its time and it's yeah. It's we're really... at the age now, Mitch. Like we're very close in age, and we're still really wanting to talk about this game. I think that just shows how good the game is, you know, and how well it's been produced. Right. And I know, Marcus, that you were talking in other interviews about not wanting to date the game with certain phrases or um, avoiding like a certain reference to a, maybe like a world event or something. Is there one in particular that you remember being in the Japanese version that you avoided putting in the English speaking version? Um, well, you know, the, w- when, when I talked about not wanting to put in certain things that were too tied to, um, you know, a time period and stuff, the the things I was more talking about were you know sort of like catchphrases and stuff like that that would have been in television shows, right? Um, and that kind of thing I didn't want to put in because I knew that that stuff gets old and just gets dated really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I mean, there are things in the Japanese version that you know are refer back to stuff that happened in history. Um, you know, one of the most sort of recognized things I guess is is the fact that you know the happy happy cultists are actually based on a, a cult in Japan that ended up sadly becoming pretty dangerous at, at one point and um, oh, wow. and they actually uh, released a bunch of sarin gas on the subways in Tokyo and wow. uh, yeah so um, so the, the happy happy cultists were kind of based on this group and um, what were they called? Om Shin Rikyo was the Japanese name. I want to do research on the. I want to, I want to go on the Wikipedia page and read up all the references to like check in to see yeah. like what I find with the happy happy cultists now. Yeah. So you know, and that was the story. Is that you know, in in Japanese, that's what they were sort of based on the the happy happy cultists. You know, in English, we didn't have anything that. Yeah. I mean, I I could have tied it to a number of other cults that we've had in you know. Drinking the Kool Aid, maybe, or exactly all of that kind of thing. But I kind of didn't want to get too far. I mean, I, 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 I wanted it to be um, a little, again, a little more subtle than just sort of making it seem like it's a, a straight up copy of the, yeah, you know, the Kool Aid cult and that kind of stuff. Well, that's cool. And before we get into biting off the large meal that is Gigas and what it represents and what he's saying, um, then uh, is there a question that you've never been asked that you're surprised and like you're itching to tell people but no one's just thought of it yet? (laughs) 
Uh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> not that I can. Well, so I, I will tell you the bit that I told you about Paula, and mm. and, and the way that that I know I purposefully made her um, sound the way she did was because I wanted her to be more you know American than Japanese. If if you want to just simplify it down to that level. Um, you know, no one's ever asked me about that. And that's something I don't think I've ever actually ever sort of confirmed, you know, about this stuff. Um, but that that was one that, you know, in the course of talking about the game and things like that. And, you know, especially probably in the last, you know, six months or so, it's it's been one of those things where I thought, eh, you know, I'd actually like to maybe get it out there that, you know, my idea of, of what I wanted a woman's, you know, a female role to be in the game, I wanted to sort of explain that a bit. And so that that thing I got to do today with you guys, and that was, you know, that's really a, a good chance for me. And, um, yeah, because I I, I, I want to I want to see the game industry sort of move move forward off of the, you know, yeah, females as as victims always kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I I appreciate that, and thank you for sharing that with us. That's also it's important to you, and along with that, what struck a chord with me was um, you revealing to us, at least Jack and I, that Tony was gay, according to um, the original creator of you know the script yeah. and all that. But had that been announced, and was that was that like widely like known in the fandom yet? Because I I mean, as much research as I'd done to look into Earthbound is you know my, after just beating the game, right? I I didn't seem to find any like any um, info on anything going on with. Jack Jeff and Tony. Well, so so the one thing, and I'm, and I'm not sure if, if this is where you would see some of that information, but um, there is this really... Did, have you guys ever been to a site called uh, Legends of Localization, it's called? Yeah, I just went to it last night. So there's a whole bunch of info out there. Um, it's, it's, you know, there, there was a, a fan translation of Mother 3, mm-hmm. and the guy that did the fan translation is the one that did... Uh, the translation analysis of Mother 2 to Earthbound. Right. And he's got this huge website that goes through just all kinds of, of analysis of what there was in the Japanese and mm-hmm. what there was in English. And then, you know, a lot of times he'll say, yeah, there's a big difference here and I'm not sure why. And, you know, and so in, in one of those cases was the Paula bit. And, you know, and I knew, and I knew why. <laughs> so you're but sitting over here, I, like, evilly, like, twiddling your fingers, like, <laughs> they noticed. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and every once in a while, there'll be something that I'll see or they'll say, I wonder why that was. And, and I'll think to myself, well, okay, I probably should tell people about something or other, you know, sooner or later. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that sort of kicked off a lot of my um, involvement with the Earthbound community was actually because of my daughter and because they had let me put her name in the game. And and I've told this story a lot of times, so a lot of people already know it. Yeah. But they let me put her name into the Magic uh, area, you know, just on a, on a character. And because she was born while I was doing the work. And, uh, you know, it was because I saw somebody, you know, and, and again, this goes back to the fan community being, you know, just really great people. You know, they were making up all kinds of stories about, you know, my daughter, my daughter's name, Nico, mm-hmm. and the Nico character. And they were trying to figure out, you know, who is this? Is this like somebody that was Ness's old girlfriend or whatever? And I thought, well, you know, this is just one little line in a big story. Right. I don't mind telling people why I use why Nico is in there. And yeah, so was I Nico did the character that said, uh, Ness, I used to used to have a crush on me or something like that, right? No, no. The Nico character is the one that says, um, "Let's run and dance and play," or something like that. Right. In Magic yeah. Games. That you know that did kind of stick out to me, and I was wondering where where she came from. So, yeah, and that's cute. And um, well, then Lane is um, uh, is a gender neutral name, as I understand it to be. And um, then Ness would have also been named Lane if you chose one of those don't care options, and that ended up it being is. one of your daughter's names. And then um, yeah. obviously we just discussed Nico. That's like cool. It is very cool. well. Yeah, so I mean, in a weird way, I mean, I, I actually got like my wife's name is is an alternate for Paula as well, and oh, really? my mm. yeah, so my wife's name is Marie, and I'm pretty sure I put Marie in as an alternate name for for Paula. Oh, cool. Um, and then my so yeah, cool. my youngest daughter, she wasn't even born yet, 
but I, you know, my wife and I knew we liked the name Lane, and so I ended up putting it in as a Ness alternate. And you know, when she was born, like you said, it's a it's a sort of gender gender neutral name, right. and we liked it. And we gave it to her, and uh, so yeah, so so she's you know got the uh, the Ness alternate, and then and then yeah, my older daughter, her name has always been in because, like I said, she was born while we were doing the work, and she. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just that one little character in Magic and, and, and you know, and, and like I said, I, I just thought it was so awesome that people were sort of making up stories around it and stuff. And I thought, well, this is it. Like I said, this is a teeny thing. I can straighten this out and not feel too bad. <laughs> and then the snowball kind of started going. And so now I've told people, you know, probably a lot more subtle stuff than I probably should have in some ways. But uh People keep asking, so yeah, I guess I I've gotten to the point where I'm I'm not, not too bothered by telling a lot of that stuff. And as for questions that I wish I would answer, you know, I don't there there isn't a ton of stuff that I'm I sort of feel like I'm hiding anymore. Um, and a lot of it comes down to somebody coming up and asking me, oh, there's this line in the game. Did it have any meaning? And sometimes I'll listen to it and I'll think, oh yeah, that's right, I did put yeah. that in because of something or other because it's not a line that I really think about very often, obviously after 20 years. Um, so some of that stuff just sort of comes on the spur of the moment, but, uh, yeah, you know, the big things in the game that I, you know, sort of remembered doing, yeah, is, is sort of like the, the slight change of the Paula character and some of that kind of stuff, you know, but, uh, and then, and then, and then of course I remembered all the things that we did just for legal reasons. You know, we took all of the references to alcohol out and turned them into coffee. Right. You know, right. because we because I was from Seattle and you know, coffee was like a big <laughs> deal even back then. So, so we made everything coffee based. And uh, I'm surprised know, that Ness didn't go shopping at a Starbucks as opposed to the store that just labeled itself as drugs. Well, <laughs> yeah, that was that was one that we should have changed, and we missed that one. So. <laughs> yeah, the desert, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah when yeah, I saw that, that, I wrote to Jack. I was like, "This this says drugs. This all, that's all it says. Not drug store. Just yeah. <laughs> well, and that's because that's what it actually is in Japan. Now, like in Japanese, they didn't. It, it actually says drugs in the Japanese version. It is meant to be a drug store. Still, it's not meant to be like a drug dispensary. Yes. No. Right. <laughs> no, it's it's a drugstore and it just says drugs because it's supposed to be a drugstore. Yeah. And Lost in translation, one, like I, I said, guess. <laughs> yeah, there's a few things art, like graphics wise, art wise, there's a couple of things we missed. Um like there is, I know there's a cross on a, a tombstone someplace that we missed. Because we I were, think it's we for were the flying taking, men. Saw, yeah, I can't so there but there's we, 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 we wanted to get all the religious stuff out. Right. Um, we wanted to get, like I said, all the references to alcohol and smoking or anything else like that. We that was that was, you know, the big the big thing that we knew we had to do for the US market. You know, it's funny now now that um, you're saying that, that that the cross was a moment that you forgot to take out graphically. I appreciated it more because I thought that it was meant to have more significance because the cross was um <laughs> Actually, for a, a gravestone of a character called Buzz Buzz. Buzz Buzz okay. is the one that you talked to in the beginning, the, bu- the bee that sure. lets you into uh-huh. the prophecy of Gigas and how you're going to defeat him. And it's cute because, like, you're in a uh, Magnican and, you know, Ness is just not walking around naked anymore. He's in his pajamas. I know that that was another transition thing. Yeah. yeah. But, which is weird, too, because it's, it's, um, that's neither here nor there, though. But yeah, and I, th- I actually kind of got um, a little bit emotional when I saw that cross because I was like, that's a grave. That's for my friend who just helped me out and defended me against the Starmen, and it was great. And then, of course, Pokey's mother had to go and kill him. That was just upsetting. That reminds <laughs> me, though. That does remind me that of. That was really uh, upsetting. <laughs> that was very upsetting. And that scene is also upsetting because Pokey's abuse, parents yeah. seem to abuse their children more than just a typical spank on the bottom. And the writing was just like. Like, there was a large thump upstairs, and the mom goes, oh, geez, he doesn't punish them enough. He's too much of a sweetheart. Did you know that when you were writing that, that he was an abusive father? Yes, you know, so that actually was another case where I kind of tried to tone down the sort of parental, you know, abuse kind of side of things. Like, like in Japan, it wasn't viewed as sort of as big a deal to, like, uh-huh. hit the kids or whatever. And so... I do know that I tried to make it so that it wasn't quite so, again, obvious that, right. you know, one of these kids is upstairs getting beaten. Um, and and I think that I'm trying to remember if we changed the sound effect to something a little less. <laughs> but we might not have. We, the sound effect might have stayed the same, but we tried to make the text so that it didn't sound quite so obviously child abusive almost. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean- yeah. 
that's why the contrast of the mom talking after and saying like that he's too soft on them. I mean, I know what you were going at, but I think it almost end up being worse because it made me feel like she would beat the children even harder if it was her yeah yeah or or, or she was or she was happy to ignore it (laughs) right yeah which is worse that you know a parent that just you know knows that the kid's getting beaten and does nothing to help them yeah yeah that's probably true i mean well it's fine though because i think i think pokey needs a reason to be as obscene as he is he needs a reason to be as obnoxious and mean and you know, as annoying and relentless as he is because he doesn't have pe- love from his parents. His parents, like his dad, you know, ends up coming along with him when he's, when Pokey's for some reason the assistant to, um, you know, that guy in the, in uh, Forsen or uh, in Forsyth. It's, so it's, it's, what was that? Is it Monotoli? Yeah, the Monotoli building, right. So oh. it's it's funny too because the dad even kind of, you know, down talks Ness and you can see where Pokey, you know, gets his attributes of, you know, his horribleness from, from his father <laughs> yeah. right there. And it, it's um, – that part also, it, it struck a very particular note with me. I was like that's that's a lot more of an emotional of a story than I thought I was going to get out of this really lame, porky-looking villain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean I will, I will tell you that writing the – pokey lines were a, a ton of fun yeah i actually really enjoyed trying to do things that i just knew would push as many people's buttons as possible oh yeah no i definitely and, would <laughs> well <laughs> it, it does seem like that yeah a lot of people say tell me you know man i just hated the pokey character um you know we we managed to get and and i'm gonna and, and i think this is something else i haven't really talked about to anybody else but um you know in the Nintendo office, there was, you know, a group of us that all worked together. And some of us would work on games, and some of us were in sort of a, a a lot check area they called it, which is sort of a testing process that every game has to go through that gets released on uh, on Nintendo platforms. And it's just a bunch of guys, and we tended to be very, um, uh, you know, I mean, it's competition and and just you know, but but a lot of funny just you know, one-upsmanship from one person to the next sort of always was, was kind of going on. And so the way Pokey talked and the way he did things kind of came from a lot of the smack talk that kind of went on in the office. Oh, really? So, yeah. So, you know, the things that, you know, I knew were irritating in the office really worked well in the Pokey character as well. Well, I mean, how about his last line where he's, come and get me, losers, spankity, spankity, spankity. spankity. <laughs> That's exactly, that. That is, that is a line from somebody in the office that they used to say that. Oh, you're kidding. Nope. That's, that is so funny. That's, yeah, and, 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 and it just worked great because I think a lot of people, you know, really sort of latched onto that as being just sort of quint- quintessentially, uh, you know, insulting and, and, and funny at the same time. Yeah, no, it cracked me up. I thought it was very funny, and it, it's also a bit, um, I, I wouldn't even say perplexing, but um, I, I know it's purposeful that Pokey is in his, in the in the Gigas battle now, Pokey is in his, his super armor, and he's he's uh, kind of taunting you and talking about a devil's machine, and um, well, before we go on to like what Gigas is saying, let's talk about what pokey is doing like because he just shows up to this battle and somehow seems to know how to time travel along with you and i don't know it's almost like gigas has empowered pokey with some more power but then pokey took him back over from the dialogue that's what i was understanding so um is there anything more you can tell me about what pokey was doing there um probably not i you know the the end of the game was a part of the game that I didn't get to see until really late in the development, and I had already actually written a lot of the end dialogue. Um, so I, to be honest with you, I never quite understood some of those subtleties of the of the last battle. The only thing that I really you know wanted to convey was um, you know that that Pokey has been your nemesis, obviously for. Uh, a long time in the game and, and at stages has just continually appeared and, and you know, how he does it and things like that. I didn't think I really cared too much about how or why or, or anything. I just kind of wanted him to be, you know, a human embodiment of, of, you know, Nessa's big nemesis. And then, you know, Gigas, which that is the way I always pronounced it. Right. Um, 
Gigas is, you know, a, a, a totally different kind of evil. Um, you know, he is the embodiment of insanity, and and I'm and, and I'm pretty sure that it was explained to me that that is that is the way Itoisan wrote him. He wanted him to be, you know, the as frightening as possible because he is, you know, immensely powerful, but also has no reason, you know, and and so that that's the the way. I tried to write him and to, to, to have him say things that were just as, um, ominously, uh, you know, crazy as I could sort of possibly think of. Yeah. And it, it's funny too, to me that you're saying that Gigas is more of an embodiment of insanity. I can see that. I can also see the one theory that I, like I said, I want you to shoot down. I don't, I don't want this to be true. That, and it has before. So I just want to hear your authority. That that Gigas is is a fetus in this form. Like you're you're you're, um, and it kind of envision. I can envision that with the way it looks, where you're walking up on these very veiny looking platforms to get to like the umbilical cord or the belly button of Gigas, perhaps I can't really tell, but so gross. <laughs> it is. And it, it starts to feel like a fetus. It starts to feel like you're fighting the fetus because of the way you just all, all the imagery comes together. And uh, that's where I, 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 I want your authority on this because I get confused with um, lines like Ness. It's Ness turned back. It's too late and it feels so good and it hurts so much. So I know those maybe could just be drawn off as, Oh, those are insane things to say. But then also, the fact that Gigas is, you know, talking to Ness in particular, I almost started to think th- that Gigas was Ness, this was Ness fighting his own fetus. I don't know. I don't know how time travel is going to work in, <laughs> in the Earthbound series until I've played the other games. But, you know, this could be a form of time travel wherein you could kill your past and there's that's a different alternate universe or some not. So um, what, what's more you can enlighten me here on why Gigas was talking to Ness in particular other than him being like the hero of the story? Yeah, so you know the the end fight. Um, I mean, I obviously have heard the the theories and, and things like that as well. Um, you know, I, I think one time I I did sort of respond to those to that question of whether there is a fetus involved and, and things like this. And um, you know, the only thing I can say for sure is that when I was when I was told what the Gigas fight was like and what it was about. Um, a fetus was was never mentioned nor a part of it. Now, I know that people have taken screenshots and you know outlined all of the bits that 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 seem to make people think that that there's some deep sort of subtle meaning there. Um, all I can say is I didn't write it that way because they didn't tell me that that was anything there. If a person wants to think that that, that that's there, I, I don't have any problems with people thinking that. Mm-hmm. But I didn't I didn't write it with any of that stuff in mind. Um, and as for the artwork, you know, in terms of it going into a belly button and things like that, the, the, the thing that's kind of funny about that is um, the art to me was sort of more reminiscent of, a, of an artist called – his name was H.R. Giger. And he's probably best known for the artwork that was an inspiration for the Alien movie. Mm-hmm. And and if you've sort of seen the you know the Alien monster that is in you know the Alien and the Aliens movies, right. and sort of the um, the the form that some of the uh, uh, sort of architecture, I guess you could say, of that civilization of the of this, you know, alien has a certain look and it's all taken from this this artist named H.R. Giger. And so I always thought that, you know, the art that was in the game was really more of an homage to that than it was trying to convey, yeah, you know, this is a, you know, a, a trek into, yeah, whatever, you know. It, think of it however you want, I guess. Um, so I've always thought that it's more more to do with the artist and H.R. Giger and sort of a, like I said, sort of a, a visual homage to his art than it is to all of these other things. But the, but again, 
this is just sort of me speculating and because we didn't really go into it and talk about it that much um the overarching bit about the gigas battle in the end again was it was more explained to me that he is just you know sort of an, an embodiment of insanity and is meant to be as as sort of like i said you know unreasonable and, and strange and and unknowable for a human as as possible and uh and that's the way i wrote that interesting yeah and is there anything more about the the term devil's machine that you can tell me other than um, you know, maybe Being that pregnant. that's what it just was originally in the Japanese version. I mean, if it Probably. was, if, if that if that's what it originally was, though, um, what's your interpretation of that being the devil's machine? Because that seemed it seemed to make me feel like I was in hell all of a sudden, like I I was fighting perhaps maybe the devil himself. I don't know. Like I I I think Gigas is, yeah. is really ambiguous at this point. Well, so so this is this is the part that that goes back to a, a bit of the difficulty with like Japanese culture and things like that. I mean, I think. In, in Japanese culture, you know, devils or demons and things like that are a part of, um, you know, Japanese folklore and, and this kind of thing. And so when they used the word for devil or demon, um, I'm not sure that they that it was meant to be the same as what we think of when we say devil or demon. Like more like and Lucifer I'm, or Satan for in Yeah, for us, for Western it's, audience. It's a, yeah, and then in Japan, I think it's more like just a malevolent spirit kind of a thing. Um, because, you know, I don't, in Japanese uh, sort of religion, they don't really have the concept of hell per se. Um, you know, I don't think that's got anything to do with, you know, what they believe. So when they talk about a devil, I think they're just talking about more like a malevolent spirit. But the thing is, when we did the translation, I'm pretty sure it got, it got changed into devil. And I probably just didn't change it because I didn't know of any better phrase for it um and so right. the devil's machine probably doesn't have any great meaning you know um mm-hmm. any special secret meaning there it probably is one of those it, it was it was just a, a quirk of the translation well okay that makes sense for me i, I can get that much <laughs> but feel free to think of it however you like that's the, <laughs> that's the beauty of the game yeah yeah that's a, that that's a good point and I, I think we're just about rounding up um with all that we had in, for our questions it's, it's it's been great talking to you and um yeah we wanted to uh learn actually how to check in with any of your projects and what you're working on so that if people liked your writing so much in earthbound they knew where to follow you nowadays so that they could get more of that um well so i i i started a, a small company about five years ago and we're working on a game that um, we're going to release on Facebook. Um, but the name of the company is Carried Away Games. And the uh, the game that we're working on is, is actually going to be sort of an RTS kind of a game. So very far away from the RPG and old school kind of thing with, with Earthbound. Um, but we are going to sort of have a, a loose story in the game. And so, yeah, we're going to have some hopefully kind of interesting, goofy writing as well. Um, so if people ever wanted to, to play the game, they certainly are, are hopefully welcome to. The game is not out yet, though. And if you, but if you go to Facebook and you search for The Robot Apocalypse, that's the name of the game, um, we actually have a page up where we're starting to put information and things like that. And hopefully the game is going to go live in the next month or two, a month or two months, hopefully at the latest. Oh. Um, feels like we've been there for a long time, but yeah, we're getting close now. Well, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I think that's great that, you know, you're still doing some work out there that people could continually check in on. I mean, 20 years later and, you know, you're still out there writing games. So, and, uh, I mean, this is the man, the myth, the legend, Marcus, and I think that you did a great job of, you know, embodying everything that we want to talk about in our Earthbound review, and thank you very much for coming on. So, um, is there anything final that you thank wanted you. to say? Um, well, you know, again, thank you to you guys for playing and for being interested and, you know, enjoying the game as much as you did, and in the end deciding it was, you know, worth the time to to sit and talk to me and also to write reviews and things like that all these years later, it never ceases to amaze me. And, uh, yeah. So thanks. Thanks to you guys and, and all the other fans that have kept the game going.